21. Son of man, I have broken the arm of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Okay, that's God talking. It says, thus says the Lord. The Lord's talking to Ezekiel. He says, I've broken the arm of Pharaoh. Okay, listen to me. God never broke his arm physically. He never broke his literal arm. We have no record of that. It's not what he's talking about. He's speaking symbolically, right? He's saying, I broke his power. I broke his strength. That's what I did. So God does this a lot through Scripture. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is because when you begin to see it, it causes this book to come, up, come alive to you and just jump off the page. It's, this is a great thing when you're beginning in God, or even when you're growing in God, or close to God, or God-centered. It's, it's wonderful to see these things in Scripture. So remember, here's one that I'm going to show you. Jesus said, the birds of the air, the birds come. They said, well, who are the birds? He said, well, that's Satan. Now, when the Bible speaks of Satan, it's not always talking about the person of Satan only. It's talking about the work of Satan. Because he has a third of the angels fell with him. He has demonic spirits that do his work. Spiritual host of wickedness, principalities and powers. All right? So, demons. Let me show you another verse where it talks about birds. And you'll see very clearly it's talking about demonic spirits. Uh, Revelation 18 verse 2 says, And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. Babylon is fallen. It's become a place of demons, foul spirits, and birds. Okay, that's not talking about literal birds. It's talking about demons, demonic spirits. When you read birds in Revelation 18, what are you going to do with that? Do you really believe that there are going to be literal birds flying around when it says it's Babylon has become a place of demons, foul spirits, and birds? And if you go back to Mark 4, Jesus said, now listen, birds represent the demonic spirits. Uh, let me show you another verse. In, in, in Deuteronomy, it's talking about the blessings and the curses. He says, if you follow me and obey me, these blessings are going to come on you. But if you disobey me, these, these curses are going to come on you. And listen to one of the curses. Deuteronomy 28, 26. Your carcasses shall be food for all the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and no one shall frighten them away. Now, again, think about Mark 4. Jesus said the birds of the air come. They said, well, who are the birds of the air? Well, that's Satan. That's who that is. Jesus, Jesus himself said that. So when I was young in the Lord, and I'm reading in Deuteronomy, and he said, listen, you walk away from me, and the birds of the air are going to come after you. I thought, I know what the birds of the air are. I saw that in Mark chapter 4. And then it says beasts. Birds and beasts are mentioned in the Old Testament together 44 times. 44 times. And let me show you a verse where it's obvious, again, that beasts are talking about the, demon, the demons, the demonic spirits. I'll show you. This is a verse that talks about God's sheep and God's shepherds. Okay, he's not talking about, this is parabolic language. I don't know of any theologian that would disagree with this. He's not talking about literal sheep and literal shepherds. And if you want to know, well, how do you know for sure that sheep is referring to God's people? Psalm 100 verse 3. The Lord, you go through Psalm 100, but what's Psalm 100 verse 3 say? We are the sheep of his pasture. John 10 tells us he's the shepherd. Corinthians tells us that we pastors are under shepherds. We shepherd with him. So he's not talking about literal sheep and literal shepherds. He's talking about his people and pastors. But watch what happens when pastors don't feed his sheep. Okay? Ezekiel 34 verse 5 said, so they, that's talking about the sheep, were scattered because there was no shepherd, watch, and they became food for all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. Now see, this is what bothers me. Is people will say, now that's, that says sheep, that's not talking about real sheep, that's talking about people, God's people. And it says shepherds, but it's not talking about real shepherds, it's talking about pastors. But now beasts of the field, that's lions and tigers. No, that's not literal beast. A spiritual beast. There are spiritual beasts that want to come after you. And spiritual birds that want to come after you. Genesis 3.1 says, now the serpent, okay, let me ask you something. Who's the serpent? How do you know? 
Well, we just know. <laughs> okay, there, when I say something represents something, I can give you book, chapter, and verse. I'll never tell you this represents this without giving you book, chapter, and verse. Revelation 12, 9 says, the, so the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan. Okay, so we know. Obviously, we know that it was Satan. So here's what I'm asking you. We assign a spiritual meaning to serpent. We say, that's talking about Satan. Is it possible there's another spiritual meaning in the verse? Remember, there are also other fallen angels, demonic spirits. Watch the rest of the verse. Genesis 3, 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. <laughs> is it possible that that is saying in the spiritual language, Satan is the most cunning of all the fallen angels? I'm telling you, there's a lot in this book we haven't seen. It's amazing. Um, when Jesus was in the wilderness being tempted 40 days, Satan was there tempting him. The angels, the good angels, were there ministering to him. Do you think it's possible that the demons, the fallen angels, were also there attacking him? Watch this verse because it doesn't make any sense to me unless you see spiritual language in the Bible. Mark chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. Immediately the Spirit drove him, Jesus, into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beasts. And the angels ministered to him. Okay, I don't think I was talking about lions and bears. The one who could stop the mouths of lions, it wouldn't tell us. Now, there were also lions and bears there, and Jesus had to hide sometimes and climb trees and all. No, it means the hordes of hell were there. The principalities and powers and the spiritual host of wickedness. They were all there trying to come against the Son of God. But it tells us they were wild beasts. Okay, let me just show you a couple more. These are things that jumped out at me when I was beginning in God, all right? Shows me that it caused the Bible to just, every day I couldn't wait to read the Bible to see what else was in there that I didn't know, that I couldn't, had never heard of. Isaiah 4 verse 1 says, And in that day seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, We will eat our own food and wear our own apparel, only let us be called by your name to take away our reproach. But when you understand there are types and shadows in the Bible, women represent churches. The church is the bride, not the groom, the bride of Christ. And all through Scripture, women will represent churches. And I could show you lots of verses on that. And in Revelation, chapters 2 and 3, it talks about seven women, seven churches. And those seven churches represent the end-time church. The Bible also talks about the one man, the new man, the new Adam, Jesus. Now watch this. Is it possible that this is what this verse is saying, symbolically? And in that day, I, this is Isaiah. Now Isaiah, when he says that in that day, he's talking about the last days. And in the end times, the churches, lots of churches, they're going to take hold of one man, Jesus. But they're going to say to him, let us eat our own food. Let us teach our own doctrines. And let us wear our own apparel. Apparel, clothes, always have to do with righteousness. He's clothed us with his righteousness. Let us have our own form of righteousness. Let us teach our own doctrines. And let us have our own form of righteousness. But let us still be called by your name to take away our reproach. We still want to be Christians. But the culture's changing, God. You've got to understand that what was wrong 40 years ago, it's right today. It's not right. It's still wrong. It's still wrong. <laughs> Leviticus 26, 26. When I've cut off your supply of bread, now you ought to already be thinking, what's bread represent? It represents the Word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Bread all through Scripture represents the Word of God. Give us this day our daily bread. Give me, give me a word from you today, God. When I cut off, this is when they walked away from God. I'm going to cut off your revelation. When I cut off your supply of bread, ten women shall bake your bread in one oven. They shall bring back your bread by weight, and you shall eat it and not be satisfied. Okay, is it possible? Here's what he's saying. When you walk away from me, when the church starts walking away from me and having their own form of righteousness, their own form of holiness, 
I'm cutting off your revelation. I'm going to make it dry for you. When I do this, lots of different churches are going to prepare your Sunday school lessons in one place. They're going to bake your bread in one oven. They're going to bring it back to you and measure it out by weight. They're going to give you about two to three verses a week, and you'll eat it, and you'll not be satisfied. You won't be satisfied. You ever been in a church like that? You open up your Sunday school book and you think, we only get three scriptures this week. That's all we get for the whole week. Are y'all you, are, are following me? There might be some things in this book you hadn't seen. And I haven't seen. And this is a good book, by the way. It was, it was written by a genius. Did y'all know that? Smarter than me. Smarter than you. All right, here's number two. Well, what's God's plan? If Satan's plan is to keep us away from this book, what's God's plan? Well, Mark 4, verse 20, if you're still in Mark 4, says, These are the ones sown on good ground, those who hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit. I'm, I'm going to tell you real simple. God, God would like for you to bear fruit. He'd like for you to be successful in your marriage, in your family, in your health, in your finances, in your business. He wants you. You want your children to succeed. He wants you to have a good life and enjoy your life. He created all this for you to enjoy. He really did. But the only way you're going to bear fruit, have a good life, a prosperous, successful life, is if you accept the Word. Amen. That's it. You've got to know the Word of God. That's, that's what he's saying here. Now, we talked last week about friendship, and we compared this to, to God becoming your friend, God becoming your best friend, and then God becoming that lifelong spouse that you'll, you'll die for, okay? Listen to me. If you don't spend three, four, five, six, seven hours studying this book outside of the one hour you spend in church every week, you're not going to make it. Amen. Because you've got birds and beasts that are coming after you. They're coming after you. You've got to know this book. So, I want you to understand that's, what, that's God's plan is for you to, to bear fruit. But the only way you bear fruit is to accept the Word, to understand the Word, believe the Word. We read last weekend, we read in this parable, Satan's trying to steal the Word out of your heart. Is there a way that we could keep him from stealing the word out of our heart? Real famous scripture, Psalm 119, verse 11. Your word I have <laughs> hidden in my heart that I might not sin, that I might not stumble. Remember, when persecution arises, they stumble, they fall, they sin. Your word I've hidden in my heart. So the enemy can't take it out of my heart. Okay, very simple. How do you, how do you hide God's Word? Uh, two words, scriptural word, meditate. A word to help us understand meditate, memorize. Uh, I don't have time to read them, but Joshua 1 uh, and Psalm 1. Psalm 1, the man who meditates on the Word of God is like a green tree planted by the water, bears fruit in season. Joshua 1, you meditate on this Word day and night that you may prosper and have good success in everything you do. You meditate, memorize it, memorize it. When I was beginning in God, I started memorizing Scripture. Last April, most of you were here then and you know, I went to Australia. They gave me some migraine, headache, uh, migraine headache medicine that caused internal bleeding. It was, it's caused internal bleeding for, in a major artery. I, I, I lost a third of my blood, over a third of my blood, in less than 24 hours. I was bleeding to death. They took me to the hospital. I was in the waiting room and I passed out. And I told you this last April, but if you're ever in the emergency room, waiting room, and they're taking too long, just pass out. Just, <laughs> just pass out. They'll, they take you right back. So anyway, um, take me back. They got the bleeding stopped. But when the doctor's telling you how much blood you've lost, and you know it, and you feel it. I mean, I felt like I was dying when I passed out. There was, I had no control. I was gone. And to wake up and know I'm still alive, and then the doctor tell you, you know, you're about to die. And we've got the bleeding stop. But then, you know, the doctor's gone. Debbie had to go. They wouldn't let her stay at the hospital. Um, I'm there alone in the room that night. I couldn't sleep, be I think, because of the medicine they gave me. I could not sleep. I did not sleep one minute. And in the middle of the night, the enemy's attacking. Death, I, mean, I don't know. I don't know if they've got this bleeding stopped or if it's going to start again. And I started having fear. And I remembered the Word. I thought, I, I need the Word. So I started, I didn't have my, my Bible with me or my laptop because, you know, we went to the emergency room. <laughs> you know, you don't say, let me pack a bag. You know, when you're dying, you just go. So, so I, didn't, I didn't have my Bible with me. 
but I had hidden some in my heart. And so I started quoting Scripture, and I remember starting at Genesis and thinking of every Scripture in Genesis I could remember. And then Exodus, and then Leviticus, and the Numbers. When I got to Ezekiel, I remembered a Scripture. And I remember when I got to Ezekiel, I remember the Scripture. And then I thought, I have my phone with me, and I have my Bible on my phone. I don't know why I didn't think of that before, but, and I think it was because God actually wanted me to go back to my heart, you know. But I got my Bible and I looked it up, and I want to show you this verse that the Lord brought back to my mind that I had hidden in my heart. And you think about what this verse would mean to you if you were told that you might die and you were struggling with a blood issue. Ezekiel 16 verse 6 says, And when I passed by you, and saw you struggling in your own blood, I said to you, in your blood, live. Yes, I said to you, in your blood, live. This is the only thing that will help you. I can preach my heart out to you. If you don't get in this book, I can't help you. God wants to speak to you today. I want you to hear that. And one of the primary ways that God speaks to us is He causes the Scripture to come alive to us. I want you to make a commitment today to read God's Word every day. And if you miss a day, don't feel bad about it. Don't condemn yourself. Just pick it up again the next day or the next chance you have. But get in a habit of reading God's Word every day because I promise you, the Holy Spirit will speak to you. And those scriptures will go deeply into your heart and will take root and will bear fruit in your life. Satan's plan is to keep you out of God's Word. God's plan is for you to have a life and to have it more abundantly. But he does that through us knowing his Word. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Hey, we're gonna continue this series next week. I'll see you then. Oh, 